Andrew Leventis, who's a senior wealth manager at Alexander Forbes, and he joins us now to talk about what Mazipo referred to as the complicated landscape of <laughs> retirement. I don't think the landscape itself is complicated, but boy, it's complicated to think about how you should prepare for it, Andrew. What are the big issues here? What are the big mistakes that people make? Well, m most people today, uh, unfortunately, do not have enough to retire on. Um, I don't think there's more than 10% of the population. I'm talking about the working population that is able to retire comfortably. And out of that 10%, probably 3-4% are actually able to retire very well. So um, the problem is that most people when they working in their working careers, and you're a young lady here, uh, would probably concern how much can I buy a new car for, um, I'm going to go on overseas trips, so I'm going to spend as much as I can. And when you get to about 50, you say, well, you know, I'm still not going to retire until I get to about 65, mm. so I'll still have got another 15 years. But in the meantime, you're actually losing time, so you're not saving enough. And it, when people resign from jobs, they actually take their money and they spend their money, mm. and they don't have enough. You know, the rule of thumb I think that you should have is if you've got at least 30 times what you need, Per annum. So, in other words, let's say you need a hundred thousand or a um, hundred thousand a year as an income, which is just under ten thousand rand a month. You need approximately thirty times that. Then you are okay, more or less okay. Mm. If you've got more than thirty times, you're really well off. If you've got ten times that, in other words, imagine you wanted an uh, income of a hundred thousand a year and you've got a million rand, you are not going to be okay. I promise you, the money will run out in five or six years. So that is one of the biggest problems: not having enough money. Uh, people spending too much and they're not saving enough. You should be saving at least, I would say, five, ten, fifteen percent of your salary when you're young, and really pushing up to twenty-five percent when you're much older. Mm. Um, you might say, well, I don't want to take my money with me. But, you know, the problem is that you're going to live a long time. You know, people are not living till 65 anymore. Well, isn't They're this the problem, yeah. Andrew, is that the whole mindset is from an era where you retired at, say, 60, and a lot of men, because men live a shorter time than women, that's, that's demonstrated, exactly 10 right. years on average. A lot of men died in the early 60s, mid-60s. A 70-year-old man was regarded as old. Very old. And very old people like 80 and 90, well, they, they just weren't around, really, and very few exceptions. Now, that's changed completely because of health, because of medicine, because of lifestyle, but the mindset hasn't. Absolutely correct. You know, um, they say that if you are retiring at 65, the probability of one of the two spouses, I'm assuming there's a spouse, uh, two partners, one will still be around 30 years down the road. So you need a 30-year horizon to pay an income. So think about this very clearly. If you had an income requirement of, let's say, 100,000 rand a year, which is just under 10,000 rand a month, and you needed 30 years of that, you need 30 times that plus the growth, you know, so it's a lo lot of money that you mm. need mm. And, and, and that's the biggest problem. Yeah. And then Andrew, how sh then should you be thinking about getting the assistance to make sure that you do, you're do you making the right provision? Let's talk a little bit about the advisors, that how do you choose a good advisor and how do you know that this person is putting you on the right journey so that come 30, 40 years from now mm. uh, that you've got the provision that you've right. made? Um, the good news is that uh, there's been a change in legislation and advisors are regulated in terms of the FACE Act. In addition to that, there's a Financial Planning institution, Institute which um, has a, a code of conduct and has registered and professional financial advisors called CFPs. You can go onto the website fpi.co.za, you can have a look at what, what they do. Um, I would recommend using a professional advisor, that somebody that has has a designation such as a CFP and probably another qualification. The other thing I would also do is look at it, how the advisor um, is licensed. I mean, the advisors are licensed only for certain products and some are, uh, are licensed for selling shares. So you need to have a general financial mm -hmm. advisor to look after you. Um, a lot of people say, should you look at an independent advisor or should you look at an advisor that works for a big company like uh, an old mutual on Alexander Forbes, it doesn't matter which company, and some say it's, it's good and bad, but it doesn't really matter. The mo most important thing is as, as long as they have a good process, they've got good research, and they've got um, a, a good experience in, in the business, I would say that would be a good, good way to go. Another problem with advisors is that you, you might accept the need for professional advice from someone who knows the business. There's also a suspicion that the guy who's uh, giving you the advice is giving mm. to you in order to get commission for exactly, products. Exactly right. And now that is a problem. A lot of advisors are still paid under the old commission system. And today, many new advisors are paid under a fee-based system. So with whatever you advise the client to do, you shouldn't be shouldn't have a conflict of interest. For example, I'll get paid more for putting a client into that investment 
versus putting it the, in, into that investment. So it's rather a fee-based structure would be the most important, where your advisor and yourself are aligned to a common goal. There's lots of talk about have, looking at uh, a device, diversified portfolio when you are saving for your retirement. What are the various options in terms of what you could possibly look at? Okay, um, diversified portfolio, you know, a lot of people get confused. You know, you asked me earlier on in the, in, the, in the meeting about your putting money away into a retirement annuity. A retirement annuity, as an example, is simply an investment vehicle that has got a tax structure. But inside that retirement annuity, you've got investments such as cash, bonds, property, equity, offshore investments. So those are what we call asset classes. So I don't really care about the product per se. I'm really worried about what asset classes you have. For example, as a young person, you should have more towards equities. As an older person, you're probably going to have less in equities, depending on how much money you've got. If you've got a really a lot of money, you can have any, everything in equities or you can have everything in cash. It really doesn't matter. So the important thing is the main asset classes, cash, bonds, equity, property, those are your the, the investments that are going to drive, for example, equities gives you growth, cash gives you security, bonds are sort of in between. Offshore investments protect you against the, your weakening currency, your political risk. By the way, if you were an investor living in Canada, I would also say have an offshore portfolio. So it doesn't mean to say because we live in South Africa, mm. you should have an offshore portfolio. So um, assets, classes are important and the vehicles. So in other words, there are two types of uh, investment vehicles. You can have what we call retirement funds or retirement type vehicles like retirement annuities, pension funds, profit funds. That doesn't really matter what they're called. They're retirement funds. And then non-retirement funds like unit trust shares, property investments where you rent your property out. So the most important thing is you need a pile of money about 30 times what you've got. Mm. 